I'm sorry, sir, but you can't send any swear words in a telegram. Eleven pound boy arrived. Mother and child doing okay. Who said America was through? I'll repeat. A paid uh, telegram to Dr. Murray Reed, 219 uh, Temple Avenue City. Congratulations, uh, stop. Plans afoot for a small party in your honor. Manville Penthouse, next Saturday, 10 p.m., a stop. Maintain secrecy, a stop. Promise you most original party ever slated. Signed, your host. Yes, sir. I'll send that to the eight addresses you gave me. Please deposit $3.36 in the coin box. Thank you. Gee, that guy's got a spooky voice. Maybe he's an undertaker. No, he's throwing a party. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Osgood. Why, no, of course I'm not too busy. I see you've gotten rid of young Abbott, Doctor. Thanks for acting so promptly. Well, you may rest assured that I will never retain anyone on the faculty who is distasteful to you, Mr. Osgood. Yeah, but he claims it wasn't radicalism. He says it was just constructive patriotism to, to train the next generation to take care of, of <coughs> crooks like you, Mr. Osgood, who, who cheat the investing public. <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the papers tonight will carry the story of your latest gift to us. Oh, that wasn't necessary, Doctor. You know how I dislike publicity. Perhaps my example will encourage others. All right, Doctor. Keep up the good work. Get the afternoon papers. Clip all references to my gift to Rayburn University. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a Mr. Henry Abbott waiting to see you. Abbott? Probably wants me to have him reinstated in the university. Let him wait. Yes, sir. And get campaign headquarters. I want to talk to Burke. Yes, sir. Mr. Abbott. Yes. Uh, Mr. Osgood says for you to wait. Thank you. Oh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Burke. Hello, Burke. What's up? Is this true? Thirty years ago, when when I was a boy. Why didn't you tell me? You know what you've done? You've handed the mayor's chair to Tim Cronin's man on a platter. For 30 years I've been straight. There hasn't been a whisper. How did they find out? That woman lawyer of Cronin's. Sylvia Inglesby. Yes, yeah, she traced me back every step of the way. My whole career ruined. Your career? What about mine? We've held you up as a stainless character. And you come sniveling in here the day before election and tell me that you're a jailbird. You've let Tim Cronin make me the laughing stock of the whole city. Get out! But I... Get out! Get me Tim Cronin's office. Yes, sir. Mr. Abbott is still waiting, sir. Tell him that Dr. Reed's decision is final. Yes, sir. Mr. Abbott. Yes. Mr. Osgood says to tell you that Dr. Reed's decision was final. Ask him if he needs a new candidate for mayor. Jason Osgood would like to speak to Mr. Timothy Cronin. <laughs> what do you say? Mr. Cronin is in conference. With his attorney, Miss Sylvia Inglesby. Yeah, why didn't you tell him that? Osgood would have got a kick out of it. It's going to be hard on Burke. 
It was the only way we could get at Osgood. We had to smash that good government league of his. <laughs> and don't you waste any sympathy on Bert. He shouldn't have gotten our way. It must be nice to have everything your own way. You ought to know. <laughs> Goodbye. Lumps, June. You know, Margaret, your party last night settled a problem for me. Really? What was it? About the Cronin girl. She's been everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't quite make up my mind about her. Of course, when you left her out, that decided me. <laughs> well, I've no doubt she's a very nice girl. But after all, she is the daughter of a corrupt politician. And one must draw the line somewhere. <laughs> very grand, madam. Oh, thank you. Another telegram, Miss Jean. <laughs> well, this certainly is our busy day. <laughs> In the gospel train I'm coming. I hear it just as I hear the car wheels moving and rumbling through the land. Congratulations. Good news, Mr. Abbott? Hmm? Oh, no. Uh, invitation to a party. friends, Margaret. Own up now, it was you who sent that telegram. Until I entered this room five minutes ago and found you here, I hadn't the slightest idea whom I was to meet or who was giving the party. But seeing you here, I had my suspicions. And I'm hardly in the mood for any celebration, especially after what happened at the polls yesterday. The whole town's laughing at me. I've never been so humiliated in my life. When I think of what Tim Cronin did to me, I... All right, Jason, it wasn't you. So we'll go back to Dr. Reed. Well, I know nothing whatever about it. At least... Nothing more than is contained in this telegram. Well, I think it's all a silly joke. Well, it was clever enough to bring us here. It was clever at that. Seems to me, Margaret, that somebody's trying to challenge your position as giving the city's most humorous parties. Well, tonight I'm quite content to be a guest. And when our host appears, I'm going to ask him to show me his house. The little I've seen is marvelous. Well, I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. Everything is to be done on schedule according to these instructions. If the guest should ask any questions, they to be answered with a simple statement that you do not know. Under no circumstances... How do you know we're going to get paid for this job? Well, the agents that sent us here will be responsible. They told me so. Isn't that good enough for you? Yes, it'll have to be. But just the same, I don't like it. The place is too perfect. Nothing has ever been used. You mark my words. Something is going to happen. Well, you've heard the instructions. Everything is to be timed to the second.
think I'm through. Just now, Tim Cronin's in control. But Cronin's a crook, and crooks are always greedy. He make mistakes, and then I'll have him. Cronin's a dangerous man, Mr. Osgood. I've heard some terrible stories about him. Anything you've heard about Cronin, you can multiply by two. The man's utterly unscrupulous. What name shall I say? Well, well, somebody's got a sense of humor. How are you, Osgood? I'm well, thank you. Hello, Doctor. I met you once somewhere. Speakeasy, wasn't it? I've never been in such a place in my life. All right, Doc. My mistake. Maybe it was in church. You all know Sylvia? This, I believe, is Mrs. Chisholm. I've heard my daughter speak of you quite recently, in fact. She's a very charming girl. Yeah. I'll tell her you said so. How are you? Fine, and you? Splendid, thank you. Glad to hear it. Interesting place, this. No hard feelings, I hope, Osgood. My man won and yours lost. I guess that's all there is to it. I don't think there's anything to be gained by discussing the matter. Okay. <laughs> I sure love a good loser. <laughs> what a place, eh? I haven't any idea it would look like this. Why not hold up, Sylvia? You're the one who sent those telegrams. You're wrong, my dear. I got one myself. Shall I read it to you? That's hardly necessary. We all got them. The grandest city in the world. Say, Osgood, have you any idea how I feel about that tonight? Maybe you can guess. I think we'd better go. Oh, Doctor. Doctor. Yes? We're leaving. We're not very popular here. What do you want to go for? Why, you only just come. Somebody planned a swell party, and now you want to run out on it. Everybody makes hoopy on Saturday night. We've got that much in common, anyhow. Good night. Hello, folks. Well, this is a surprise. Why don't they build elevators all the way up to penthouses? Good evening, Miss Chisholm. Good evening. Mr. Osgood. How are you? Doctor. How do you do? Well, Sylvia. And Cronin. Hey, this is swell of you, Tim. I suppose it's your way of celebrating. Considerate of you to invite Osgood. And very nice of him to accept. I've changed my mind. I'm remaining. What about you, Margaret? As you wish. You're not thinking this is my party, are you? Well, yes, isn't it? Yeah, that's the trouble with you authors. You've got too much imagination. Name, please. Hello, everybody. Friends and enemies. <laughs> oh, this is rich. How are you, Margaret? Hello. Uh, which one do I thank? Hello, Osgood. My doctor, is this a pleasure or is it a pleasure? Hello, Sylvia. Is this your idea of a joke, Mr. Abbott? What, meeting you? You should take yourself more seriously, doctor. Hello, Jim. I'm asking if you invited me here as a perverted joke on myself. If so, I will... I? Why, doctor, have you forgotten? I'm one of the unemployed. <laughs> oh, allow me, Mr. Cronin, Mr. Abbott. Uh, isn't this your party? I wish I could plead guilty, but I don't run to this sort of thing. My guess is as good as anyone's. I picked Jean Trent. Oh, that's impossible. She wouldn't have asked me. Oh, don't be silly, Jim. Jean's too good a sport to hold grudges. Well, who else could it be? The whole thing's got Hollywood stamped all over it. Why, those people can't even pay their gas bills without a lot of drama. <laughs> Miss Jean Trent. Hello, Jean. Hello, Henry. There she is. What did I tell you? <laughs> Real? Now then, everyone, make your prettiest bows and say thank you. Jean, is this your party? My dear, your roof garden is charming. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't understand. Oh, come along now, Jean. You've had your fun now. Oh, now. Well, don't be silly, Henry. This is your party, isn't it, Margaret? No. Jean, I'm clairvoyant. I can read your thoughts like an open book. Now look me in the eye. 
You received a telegram asking you to come to this party and signed your host, didn't you? Yes, I did. I knew it. So did I, so did all of us. But the peculiar thing about this shindig is there isn't any host. name did you say, sir? Mr. William Jones. Did you send? Are you our host? Me? <laughs> oh, oh, no. Excuse me, sir. I'm the assistant butler. What? Well, you see, I ain't got no fish and soup. And I gotta wait for my brother to come home. He works in a speak up on 50th Street. And that, and that, that's why I'm so late. Go into the kitchen. Yes, sir. I regret, sir. I apologize, sir. All right, all right, all right. What's your name? Hawkins, sir. It would be. Hawkins, we'd like to know something. Who's giving this party? That I cannot tell you, madam. You mean it's a secret? I mean I do not know, sir. I was engaged this afternoon by telephone through the Castildon Agency. Typewritten instructions were mailed to me, sir. I was to come here tonight and find everything in readiness for me. How would you get in? The key also was mailed to me, sir. Your host has planned a very interesting evening, if I may say so, sir. Well, Hawkins, you seem to be as much in the dark as the rest of us. Maybe we'd understand it better if we had a little uh, glass of something. <laughs> I'll bring the cocktails immediately, sir. If you will pardon me. Don't turn that thing on, Hawkins. It makes such a beastly noise. If you don't mind, sir. Oh, but I do mind. I'm sorry, sir, but my instructions were to turn the radio on at this particular time. Patience is such a sweet virtue, don't you think, Doctor? Jean, shall I go or stay? It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference to me. Well, I don't want to spoil your evening. You can't hurt me anymore, Jim. No matter what you do. <laughs> when we were children, if you were angry with me, I thought the world was coming to an end. Now it doesn't matter in the least. We're not much for anybody to select for a party. Here's Dr. Reed. He thought so much about society, he had me dismissed from the university. But he's bearing up very bravely. We'll all be the best of friends after we've had a few drinks. Won't we, Osgood? No. Oh, now, gentlemen, let's not begin calling each other names on Saturday night. There's only one name for you. And Miss Sylvia Inglesby. That's enough. Leave Miss Inglesby out of it. It's all right, Tim. Mr. Osgood's not a very good loser. It ain't all right. Mealy mouthed hypocrite can't insult you and get away with it. Any more than that chisholm woman's going to get away with what she did to my daughter. Oh. That's enough, Cronin. You've said enough. Please, Tim, please. Why pretend to be comfortable in the society of people we can't tolerate? Meaning me, of course. Please. Take me home. Certainly. I'm going too. Are you coming, Doctor? Wait! Don't anyone leave. This is Station Wits, W I T S, broadcasting. I trust you have enjoyed the first part of the evening's entertainment. You are now listening to the voice of your host. Ladies and gentlemen, you were promised the most original party ever given in this city. Tonight, my friends, we are to play an amusing game. 
in which each of you will have ample opportunity to use your brain. This may be fun after all. Now we'll clear up this mystery. He's very clever, whoever he is. It doesn't sound like any voice I've ever heard. But where can he be? Probably sitting in another room with one of those trick microphones hooked up to this thing. I warn you, however, the stakes will be high. For tonight you are commanded to play an absorbing game. A game of death. You have been chosen with care. For only men and women of your exceptional intellectual ability will be worthy opponents. Until dawn, we will play a game of wits. Yours against mine. Do you think you can frighten us with this kind of nonsense? Jason, I am frightened. Someone's having a joke. I warn you, it is not a joke. This is the voice of one you know well. One who has planned revenge because of deadly wrong. Give attention to the rules and try to win. He hears us. You will notice the telephone connections have been cut. To touch the radio means death. It's charged with enough electricity to kill you instantly. Well, I'm getting out of here. Come on, Tim. There is no escape. The gates by which you entered the garden are also charged with electricity. I want to get out of here. Margaret, don't let this thing get the best of you. Some ghastly brand of foolishness. But Jason, Just I... Just a minute. This may be only a joke, but I've had the feeling for the last few moments that someone in this room one of us may be behind it. You're crazy. There are people here I wouldn't be found dead with. But I don't think they're capable of this. Thanks. Every one of you has some secret which you hide from the world. Through these weaknesses, I will attack you. If one of my guests lacks the courage to play the game with me, I have provided a simple means of escape. If you will look on the shelf above the fireplace, you will find a small bottle. Prussic acid. Escape? You mean suicide? Well, if one of you is doing this, won't you stop it, please? My friend, before the clock strikes 11, one of you will be dead. The one who least deserves to live. Why, this is absurd. For those of you who think it is a jest, permit me to direct you to the door at the right of the entrance. The key is in the hand on the table. Now we'll meet our host. He's been behind that door all the time. Why, of course, it couldn't be anything but a joke. Come on, give him a reception. to do is to stay in this room. Gentlemen, I've got an idea. Come on. That butler must know something. I think we better go in with the others. I think that's a good idea. All right. We'll feel better. I'm all right now.
Yeah? Then what? Come on, spill it. Then I came here, sir. I met the chef down below and we came up together. Since then, I've been carrying out my instructions, sir. Ever been here before? No, sir. You're lying. No, you don't. Find some rope and we'll tie these fellows up. You're out of circulation for a while. Did your instructions tell you what to do now? We've got to find the man who hired them. If we're going to get out of here alive, we've got to find out who's back of this. I suggest we give this place as thorough an examination as we can. As we dare. If you'll allow me, I'll divide you into searching parties. Shoot. Miss Inglesby, you go with Jean and Margaret. Examine the bedrooms thoroughly. Abbott and Cronin take the dining room on the floor beyond. Jim and the doctor can take the garden. What about the living room? I'll go through that myself. Let's go. Would you like me to go with you, Jean? Oh, no, it's all right, Henry. I'm all right now. Abbott, you better come with me. Can you hear me? It's Jason Osgood. There's nobody else in here. You said you were going to kill me. Well, I make it worth your while to let me out of this. Don't you understand? I'm not trying to threaten you. I'm trying to make a bargain. I'll give you $50,000. I won't try to find out who you are. I'll give you $100,000. More than that, if you give me time to get it. for each of us. Let's get back. Did you find anything? No, did you? No. Where's Mr. Osgood? Right here. <laughs> oh, Jason. I, uh, I thought we might need something. Hey, you're not so bad after all, Osgood. Thanks.
Look, it's 11. We're still all here, and nothing's happened. Then he's failed. You're a good health, everyone. Stop. Don't drink. You are about to meet my guest of honor, the ninth guest. The ninth guest? His name is Death. It pleases me greatly, my friends, to tell you Mr. Jason Osgood will be dead in a few seconds. Let me get his pulse. You did this. You're crazy. You wanted him out of the way so you and your crowd could do as you pleased. Now he's gone. You killed him. Why, you fool. Don't do that. You hated him. We all know that. Sure, I hated him. Not enough to kill him. You don't have to stand this kind of talk to him. Please, please, we've got to keep our heads. My friends, none of you is guilty of the death of this man. He was the agent of his own death. The drinks he offered you were poison. When he opened the bottle of prussic acid, he cut himself on the poisoned cap. Stop it! I can't stand it any longer. Oh, please, dear. Control yourself. You must. For all of us. Oh, it's that clock. Won't someone stop it? That won't do any good, Miss Chisholm. Oh, but it's that picking. He said another one of us would be gone at 12. Now, listen. We've all been told we're going to die. The next one in 15 minutes. Osgood weakened. He's dead. All we've got to do is keep our heads and nothing can happen to us. You want us to sit here like a lot of sheep waiting to be killed? Can't we do anything to fight back? Don't you see that's just what he wants us to do? Suppose we should fight back. What would we be fighting? Shadows. There must be some hiding place. He's here somewhere. Search the apartment. This is not a game of slaughter. It is a game of skill. We're trapped by a maniac. You boasted you had the whole police force in your hands. Can't you do something? What can I do? With the wires cut, how can I reach them? Jim. My friends, this is a game in which you take one side and I the other, with death as the referee. If I lose, I will appear and die before you all. <clears throat> that butler hasn't heard a word of this. I'm going to take him to the gate and tell him to get out. If he hesitates, we'll know he's in on this. Come on. If he's killed, that's murder. Murder. We're fighting for our lives. He heard you. He's taking care of the servants. Then they are part of it. I was right. There is a hiding place. Somebody untied them. They couldn't just float away. Yeah, somebody untied them, all right. That somebody is one of us. I want a showdown. And do you dare to imply that I would... Dare? Me? Caught like a rat? You bet I dare. If you're not doing this, one of the others is. Why, well, you can't talk to decent people that way. Tim, Dr. Reed. Stop it, you hear? You're acting like a couple of caged animals. That's what we are, caged. Can't you realize we've got to stick together? If we don't, we'll all be dead before morning. Get back in that living room. Sit still and don't answer a single challenge the voice offers. I tell you, nothing can happen. Sit still, nothing. I'm going to find those servants. I'm going to do it. Well, go ahead, it's your funeral. Well, we better keep an eye out. Come, Margaret. Wait. I don't want you to go. What right have you to tell me what to do? Oh, Jean, please. And please stop pretending. Pretending? Yes. Your sudden anxiety for me is a little absurd. You won't listen? No.
been in there. I know, but I want to look again. Did you find anything? Did you find anything? No. Come along, then. The others will be wondering where we are. Cigarette? It's good for the nerves. Here. Well, I tried to attract attention by burning some newspapers on the parapet, but I don't suppose anybody could see the blaze. Fifty stories up, you might as well wave a lighted match. Well, the setbacks begin ten stories down. I couldn't throw a message beyond them. I tried. You might have set the place on fire. It's like a cheap movie. Now, perhaps you'll listen to me. We've got to fight this thing with common sense. If we all stay inside and keep quiet, we'll be safe. Now, come on. If I thought that you... Oh, please, gentlemen, let's go inside. Find anything, Mr. Chisholm? No. Well? Are you going to tell them, or must I? I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. We were searching the front bedroom. You didn't know I saw you, but I did. Jean, please. Well, there's a table by the bed. There was nothing on it when we went there first. But when we went back, there was an envelope there. I saw Margaret pick it up and read it. And then she hid it in her dress. Margaret! Margaret, what was it? Let's see that letter. It isn't true. Jean, you're sure? Well, yes, of course. Sylvia, you and Jean take her to another room and search her. You wouldn't dare. Will you let us have that letter? Before the night is over, Margaret Chisholm, I will expose you for what you are. Your host. What does it mean? I don't know. I'm as ready to answer for her as for myself. There's no mystery in her life, no, no secrets. This letter may have something to do with our predicament. You've got to tell us what it means. She'll tell, all right. The time draws near when the second of our company is to leave us. I'm sure you will agree that the second, like the first, is unworthy of such a distinguished company. Before our guest departs, some details of her life may be of interest to you. Huh? I have selected for my next opponent our brilliant society leader, Mrs. Margaret Chisholm. Stop it, stop it! This woman has no right to the name you know her by. The only name to which she has legal right is that of her first husband, Jimmy Vickers from whom she was never divorced. Oh, that's not true! Margaret Chisholm's sins have overtaken her at last. Jimmy Vickers is locked up in an insane asylum. But I am prepared to expose this society leader as a bigamist. Oh, that's a lie! He's dead, I tell you! Bigamist? And my daughter wasn't good enough for your crowd. Every dollar Margaret Chisholm possesses was stolen from the husband she had committed to an institution. Oh, no, no, no! Fifteen minutes more. Stop it, please. Fifteen minutes more. Can't somebody stop her? I can't. None of you will listen to me. You told us to sit still. Nothing would happen. Now Margaret's dead. Put that down!
She killed herself. They were both killed by their own weakness. Just as that radio voice said all of us would be. It's one of us. It must be. We've looked everywhere. Yet the servants disappeared. Somebody helped them. And that letter. Somebody put it where Margaret would find it. Fifteen minutes more. He just said another would go. You're the only one here would like to kill me. Now Osgood's gone. I never earned the reputation of a killer. You have. Are you yellow school teacher? Tim, please. We're playing right into their hands. Just as we did both times before. You said it was one of us. How do we know it isn't you, Doctor? Or you? You're in league with half the crooks and racketeers in the city. There are six of us left. And everyone has something against somebody here. I never harmed anyone. You kicked me out of the university without a chance to defend myself. Please. I had to put you out because I... Well, I, I didn't like your opinions nor your, your sneering, arrogant vanity. How do we know it isn't Abbott? You have reason to hate Dr. Reed. How do we know you haven't something against all of us? Why do you leave yourself out? Wait, wait. Please don't. Yes, why? There's only one person I know who'd be happy to see me dead, and that's you, Jim. Well, that isn't true, Jean. I think you're a little snob, eaten up with self-importance. But I wouldn't kill you. Oh, yes, you would. I'll tell you all something you don't know about us. Jim and I were brought up together. Our fathers were friends. We were in love. But I soon got over it when I found out Jim hadn't an ideal in the world but money. Our fathers between them owned the Chetwood estate. They left it to us with a proviso that it couldn't be sold unless we both agreed. Because they thought we'd be married and live there. When Jim found out there was oil on the land, he wanted to sell it. But I refused. <laughs> That's when he turned against me in this newspaper column and tried to ruin my career. That's why I think you'd like to see me dead. You'd be a millionaire if you could sell Chetwood. Have you finished? Yes. Jean, I'll tell you the truth. I've loved you ever since you were a little girl. There's never been anyone else. I know you're vain and shallow. But as long as I live, I'll go on loving you. Because I can't help myself. Now you've heard all about us, and Abbott, and the doctor. What about you, Cronin, and Sylvia? Well, what about us? You both have reasons to want to see each other dead. Sylvia is the best friend I've got. Her husband filed suit for divorce yesterday, and she made him withdraw it. How do you know that? How does a newspaper man know anything? There's plenty of reason for you wanting to get rid of her. Everyone knows you're insanely jealous of her. And she has a much better reason for wanting to see you dead. You left her $250,000 in your will. Ask me how I know that. It's true, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Don't let him frighten you, Tim. But Sylvia wouldn't kill me for that. There are men within a dozen blocks of here who would kill you for much less. Now you've heard the whole works. What's your verdict? Which one of us wants to kill the other five? Don't all speak at once. searches. Margaret Chisholm had something hidden. We'd never have known it if Gene hadn't told. Maybe some of the others had something in his clothes that'll give the show away. Nobody's going to put a hand on me. So why should you object if you've nothing to hide? Well? Jim! Jim, please! Jim! Make you feel any more secure? 
Here it is. I'll take it. I've got enemies enough. I always carry a gun. Search him. Take him again. Don't you be yeah, sorry for something. What's this? A radio tube. It was you. Where did that thing come from? This is fame of that sort of... Let go, you hear? Let go. Sylvia. Put that gun down. Put it down. Like... No. Well, Jean, you don't think that I... I don't know what to think anymore. So we're all right, Jean. We're going to get out of this place. I know I'm going to die. You are not. The others all did something. They brought it on themselves. We won't. I love you, Jean. You told them all about me. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You made me feel so cheap and mean. You're not. Oh, yes, I am. Ever since... Ever since that awful thing happened to Sylvia, I, I've been thinking. I've been seeing myself as others see me for the first time. And you've seen me. You're adorable. You tried to help a selfish, arrogant girl. And she just thought you were greedy. What difference does that make? You're a success now. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm just lucky, that's all. I got the breaks that other girls didn't get. But I... I haven't really lived yet. I don't want to die. We'll find some way out of this. There must be some way. Here, drink this. 
Yes, Jim. Why are you looking at me so queerly? What have you done to me? Nothing. Oh. Now are you satisfied? One minute you admit that you're spoiled. And the next you accuse me of trying to poison you. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I don't know what I'm saying. Oh, darling, don't let anything happen to me. I want to live. I want you. Oh, Jim, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Pull yourself together, Abbott. I'm all right. Stop trying to take care of me. Let's go inside. I don't feel safe out here. Safe? Do you feel safe in there where three of them died already? Oh, come along. Come on, let's go inside. I'm all right. Leave me alone. Take your hands off oh, me. Come on. Come away from there. Will you leave me alone? Sit down, can't you? There's nothing to be gained by being a coward. You can't talk to me like that. If you're brave, it's because you've got nothing to be afraid of. I think you planned this whole thing yourself. Stop it. Can't you see what you're doing? You're fighting just as the others did before they were killed. Jean's right. It's what I've told you all along. For heaven's sake, keep still. Why did you turn those lights out? Because I don't want to be any more conspicuous than I have to. Only four of my guests are left. Dr. Reed, the well-known educator. Jean Trent, of the honeyed voice and the golden charm. Jim Daly, brilliant journalist. And Henry Abbott, just four opponents. Are we cowards? Let's do something. Let's die fighting. My friends, permit me to remind you that there is but one danger in this room. The danger that you may not outwit me. Ha! Huh. You haven't the courage to fight this through. He hears us. 
Oh, where is he hidden? Dead. Someone's out on the roof. He fired through this window. Jim! Jim. Henry. What's happened? Looks like someone's a bad shot. Oh, Henry, are you hurt badly? No. No, I don't think so. Jean, I've got to tell you, we may never get out of here alive, any of us. I love you, Jean. Oh, Henry. Please don't. Not now. I may never have another chance, dear. I want you to know I love you more than anything else in the world. I have for ever so long. I wouldn't have dared tell you except... It doesn't make any difference whether I love you or not, does it? Oh, Henry, yes, of course. Only... Only just now, we've got to find Jim. Jim! Jim! Jim, where are you? Jim! Jim, where are you? Jim! Take a tape off my eyes. Do you want to kill me the way you did all the others? Why have you got him tied up like that? Come to your senses, Jean. You realize this man has killed five of your friends here tonight? He's done nothing. He knew he couldn't get me the way he got all the others. He wanted us to think that Dr. Reed was killed by someone outside in the garden, but he wasn't. He killed Dr. Reed with a gun from this room. Then he fired the second shot at me, but he almost missed me in the dark. That hole in the glass wasn't made by a bullet. It was made when he threw the gun through the window. If you look lower down, you'll find the hole where the second bullet went through. That strip off his eyes. Jean, you don't understand. Take that tape off his eyes, quick! Jean, put that gun down. I mean it. Now listen to me. I'm going to prove that Abbott and nobody else did this. He planned the whole ghastly party. 
For a long time, I couldn't see that any of our crowd could be guilty. And then suddenly it dawned on me. Abbott was the only one in the room that the voice answered directly. It never answered anybody else. Don't you believe him, Gene? Now I know who was in that closet. You introduced me to him months ago. He was a young electrical engineer. You brought him here to wire this place and then you killed him. He's lying, Gene. Killed him in cold blood, just like you did the others. You killed him to keep your secret. Didn't you? Wait. Don't anyone leave. What is it? This is Station Wits, W-I-T-S, Broadcasting. I trust you have enjoyed the first part of the evening's entertainment. You are now listening to the voice of your host. Now do you believe me? Abbott sat in his chair every chance he could get tonight. He was in it every time the radio voice started to speak. Listen to another. meet my guest of honor, the ninth guest. His name is Death. I have selected for my next opponent our brilliant society leader, Mrs. Martin. No, you don't. Don't move, Henry. A microphone. Now we know why the radio voice could follow our every move. When he couldn't count on those records, he had this. There are probably a dozen places in the house where he could plug it in. He killed Dr. Reed and then wounded himself in some way to fool us before he threw the gun through the window. All right. I promised I'd play fairly if you outwitted me. Well, I've lost. You think I'm mad, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. Me, mad? I'm not mad. Is a man mad because he kills his enemies? I saved every cent for years to get you together like this. I rented this place under an assumed name so I could kill you. What have we done that you should want to murder us? Osgood ruined my father in the market and he shot himself. My mother died in poverty. But I didn't kill Osgood. I didn't have to. I knew he'd do anything to save his own skin. That's why I poisoned the cap of that prussic acid bottle. His own greed killed him. That doesn't account for Margaret and the rest of them. Margaret Chisholm's real husband was my brother, Jimmy Vickers. Yes, my real name's Vickers. You remember, don't you, Jim? The Vickers disgrace made fine copy for your paper. It got you your first real break. Margaret Chisholm bred my brother for every cent and left him to die in an insane asylum. But I didn't kill her either. I didn't have to. I knew she'd take the coward's way out, and she did. Sylvia Inglesby handled Margaret Chisholm's case against my brother, and Cronin pulled political strings to help her do it. He's known for years she was an imposter. But he kept still because he was counting on her to have his daughter socially set. Then why did you struggle with Sylvia over the gun? You tried to save Cronin's life. <laughs> I struggled to fool the rest of you. But while I struggled, I made Sylvia point that gun at Cronin and kill him. A life for a life. <laughs> Isn't that what the Bible says? Oh, Jim, I can't stand anymore. You think I shouldn't have killed Dr. Reed, don't you? Well, he killed me, my future, when he had me thrown out of the university. What have you got against Jean? I always loved Jean. I wanted you, Jean. I wanted to take you with me. It was the only way I could have you. He's mad. I promised if you'd win the game, I'd die in front of you. It's your last trick, Abbott. Now get us out of here or I'll kill you. Where's the switch? Trials are such messy things. 